Hello, and welcome to the Nutrition and Life Podcast. This is where we look at various nutrition and fitness-related topics through the lens of application. We want to give you practical takeaways so that you can create your healthiest, best self backed by knowledge. Now, on to the episode with your host, Coach Lisa. Hello and welcome back to the Nutrition and Life podcast. My name is Lisa, I am your host, and in today's episode we're going to learn how to boost your metabolism so that you burn more calories at rest while doing nothing. Firstly, thank you so much to everybody who has given us reviews and ratings for previous episodes. I truly appreciate your time and your feedback. And if you haven't already done so and you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It really helps us a lot. Sharing any episodes as well on your social media, simply spreading the word. Um, So thank you. And I hope you've all had a wonderful week so far. I am still here in beautiful Bogota in Colombia. I originally came here in September with the intention of only staying for five weeks, but I have truly been enjoying my time so much. Um, it's just a beautiful mixture of Latin American culture and a metropolitan city. And at the same time, it's at a great geographical location so that it makes it easy to explore other parts of the country and actually even uh, other parts of Latin America as well. So I have decided to extend my stay here until the beginning of January as well. I find it very easy to meet people here as well people are super open and I also um, know my or have even before I came knew someone here my Spanish teacher Juliana who I have been working with to get with um, since the beginning of the year essentially since I decided in Mexico that uh, I simply wanted to get better at another language. In any case, let's dive into today's episode. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because sometimes we wonder how come this person can eat so much, even though they're little, for example, how come they have a quote unquote fast metabolism? And then how come other people don't? It simply, it doesn't seem fair. And I mean, Part of that is it's not fair (laughs) because there are certain things we can't control like genetics and so on. Some people simply really do have a better genetic predisposition, but research clearly shows that this genetic predisposition really mostly just makes up about 5% and the rest is things like um, things that we have gotten accustomed to through society, things like um, other dietary habits or hormones. But also to a very large extent, um, our body fat percentage, etc. So, in order to really think about what can we change uh, in order to speed up our metabolism and what not, we need to understand what is our metabolism. So, metabolism is you know how quickly we process energy that we take in and then how quickly we transfer that into energy output for everything that our body wants to do or that we want our body to do. And essentially it's comprised of four things. It's mostly comprised of our basal metabolic rate. So the energy that our body burns when we're simply doing absolutely nothing. So that's for breathing, for our organs, for simply existing. And I think people often under estimate that or forget about that uh, and think, oh, I need to always earn my calories. And that is simply not true. So even if you have an injury, even if you're incapacitated, your body still deserves to be fed. Even if you have weeks that are busier, where you're not able to get all your training sessions and your body still deserves to be fed, you do not need to earn your calories that way. So that makes up, let's say, about 60 to 70% of our calorie requirements for most people. And then something else that is often underestimated in terms of energy expenditure or that contributes to our metabolism is the non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So all the activity that we do in our day-to-day life that might not be very conscious or sometimes like nowadays we've kind of gotten a little bit more into the conscious area with steps and so on as well but it's things like 
you simply sitting, blinking, gesturing, um, walking around. And that's that's why I said it's become a little bit conscious as well, because technically fidgeting is only true fidgeting if it's kind of subconscious and, you know, the steps and so on that you, where you're not necessarily looking at your uh, step tracker all the time. But yeah, even things like cleaning the house, just anything that is activity that's not in the gym let's put it that way and then uh, we also have energy expenditure from the thermic effect of food so that means from processing food that you intake or your body burns calories while processing food that you intake and the difference um or how we can manipulate that and i will get more into the details shortly as well but it, it very much depends if you just consume things that are really, really easy to break down or things that are harder to break down for your body. If it's super easy, if you just uh, had liquid calories the entire time, your thermic effect of food would be really low. Let's say if that was just soda the entire time or even juice, um, as opposed to if you feed your body things that need to be broken down, which of course requires more energy. So the the neat part, the non-exercise activity thermogenesis, roughly speaking, makes up about 10 to 15 percent of your calorie uh, required calories, whereas the thermic effect of food, somewhere between five to 10 uh, percent of your calories. And then, of course, lastly, we have the exercise activity thermogenesis. So any kind of calories that you burn with your actual training. And that, of course, is going to depend how often you train, what sort of training you do, how adapted you are to the training, etc. And that makes up the rest of your calorie requirements. The good news for a lot of you is also that we can't actually break our metabolism. Uh, a few years ago, people would always talk, oh, I've got a broken metabolism, or your metabolism is broken from dieting too much, etc., etc. We cannot really break our metabolism. It's more that your metabolism may have adapted to lower calories, and therefore your maintenance calories at the moment are much lower than what they quote unquote should be so it is reversible and sometimes it can take in, in some cases it can take quite a lot of time if you have been dieting for let's say year 10 years etc it's probably probably going to take you several months if not up to a year or so or several years to fully restore its metabolic your your metabolic um trust i always sort of refer to it as um, a friendship, your metabolism and, and you. If you stand up a friend once, they're probably going to forgive you and be like, ah, yeah, okay, whatever. Next time she's going to be on time. If you always stand your friend up, if you always disappoint them, if you are never reliable and they cannot trust you, soon that is going to be their belief about what you're going to do or how you're going to treat them and it's the same case with your metabolism if you constantly underfeed it if you constantly treat your body badly so to speak or you know you're not feeding it what it needs then at some point it's not going to believe that there is any food around and you will in fact feed it again after a dieting phase so if you have been um, withdrawing uh, or withholding food from your metabolism for many years and then you do a reverse diet starting to feed it more, it's probably still going to be super skeptical for some time and wouldn't respond to a new calorie deficit to a new weight loss phase very soon because it still has that doubt and thinking mm, no nah, she's not going to feed me or treat me well again after this i better hold on to this body fat i better not let go of any weight but the more you can restore that trust the more patient you are and then you go back into a calorie deficit the more likely it is that you have built up that trust bucket again just like with a friend if you show them for several months hey no i'm here i always show up on time i'm here when you need me then hopefully hopefully you can um restore their trust as well so what I often say to reverse dieting clients, the worst thing you could do would be starting your reverse diet and then after like a month or so, or if you just hit maintenance and you're like, okay, I want to cut again because of course, essentially, I know you want to lose weight, or you want to lose body fat, but if you go back into that calorie deficit too quickly, 
your body is simply not going to respond. You might drop like a pound of water weight the first week and then be right back at square one. And on the contrary, you've probably destroyed that trust again. So it's going to take building up again and going to take even longer. So if you have to do a reverse diet, if you know you have been under eating, please be patient, do your body some good and just understand that you can rebuild your metabolism, but really patience and consistency is some of the most important things here. So now let's talk about how we can boost our metabolism though, so that in the end we burn more calories at rest or simply doing nothing. What we cannot adjust um, obviously is things like our height, our age, our gender. It does, it seems like it's simply not fair if someone who's, you know, two meters or like seven feet tall um, can eat probably twice the amount of someone who's like five feet tall, but it's just the reality shorties um, have a lower calorie requirement. Females generally have a lower calorie requirement. And as we get older, we have lower calorie requirements as well. Not hugely, but you know, a little bit. So all these things we cannot change. We have to accept. And I always find it a little bit sad or tricky navigating restaurant meals because of that, because of course, in most cases, there's just one standard size, no matter whether you're seven feet tall or whether you are a five foot female or even less, right? So um, I actually used to, you know, in most families, you 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 get served the same plate, same plate size, and people don't realize, no, we should probably adjust that a little bit. I am a big fan of like if you have a social engagement, putting the food in the middle of the table and letting people help themselves because the tall, big guys might be thinking, oh, is this all that I'm getting? I'm still super hungry. And then at the same time, if someone piles up lots of food on your plate, you might feel obligated to eat all of that. Although go back to my last um, one of my last episodes on <laughs> how to say no. And hopefully you can learn to leave something on your table uh, on your plate as well. But generally speaking, I personally am a big fan of like putting um, the the pots and pans and stuff in the middle of the table and letting people serve themselves so that it's not that it's a little bit more individualized, even at home or even in any kind of social setting. But yes, so the first thing and one of the most impactful thing that we can manipulate is our lean body mass. And how do we do that? Through strength training. Through strength training, we are building up the body mass that requires the most amount of energy to be upkept. So fat mass doesn't require a lot of energy to simply just exist. It's just kind of there. It doesn't need to have a good blood circulation. It doesn't need to be maintained. Whereas Muscle mass is very demanding. It requires blood. It requires oxygen. It requires tissue to be built. So it is more expensive tissue for your body than fat mass. And um, because of that, if you have a higher body fat body fat percentage, you are going to burn less calories than if you have a lower body body fat percentage, which simply means you have more lean body mass. So if a female at 130 pounds ha- weighs or has a 30% body fat percentage, her calorie requirements are going to be lower than if the body fat percentage was only 20% because it simply means she has more lean body mass, more tissue that requires more energy. So in order to build that lean body mass, in order to have more muscle mass, we need to stimulate the muscle growth. And we do that through progressive overload, through going into the gym and continuously trying to increase the weights that we are lifting. And that doesn't mean that you need to put on more weight on the bar with every single exercise for every single training session that you're doing, but it just generally means you need to continuously push yourself. It also doesn't mean that you only have to do strength training or we should probably kind of determine strength training as well. Like would um, body weight training suffice for that? And that depends on your current stage of training. If you're someone who has already been 
going to the gym for three, four years, and now you think about just doing body weight training, chances are it's going to be rather challenging to progressively overload, especially in a structured manner. But if you're completely new to training, then that might actually be a good entry point to just do body weight squats, maybe learning how to do plank, how to hold planks, etc. And on average, we want to be training probably at least twice a week for most people more like three times again if you're more experienced maybe even four or five times it really depends but start off with the minimal effective dose where you are start off with something that you can do on a con consistent basis and then build on that i will touch on strength training versus cardio in a later point when it comes to um the exercise activity thermogenesis this first point really is more how we can manipulate our basal metabolic rate and that is by manipulating our lean body mass we cannot manipulate the lean body mass in terms of adding more bones or adding more organs or whatever um, but we can add more lean tissue in the sense of muscle mass so continuous progressive overload and in order to do so we need to supply our body with sufficient building blocks and that is what protein is protein is essentially the building blocks for our body even our connective tissue so even tendons and so on and uh insufficient protein intake of course, in addition to insufficient stimulus for muscle growth are the two things why people might struggle with this. So making sure you are eating enough. In most cases, that requires to be eating at maintenance. If you are someone who's new to training, you might actually be able to build up lean body mass in a calorie deficit. But the more experienced you get, the more likely it is um, that you have to go into at least the upper range of maintenance or even a small calorie surplus. So I personally have been kind of recomping, that's what we call it, so exchanging fat mass for muscle mass um, for probably two years or, or so. Uh, calories stayed the same, but my weight actually went down a little bit. So, you know, overall that does, um, all, and clearly my, my body composition changed as well. So over the last few months, I noticed that I was getting hungrier and that my weight had gone down. And I just thought, no, I don't want to lose muscle mass now as well. So I actually have to increase my calories. And now I'm in a small surplus with the intention of putting on more muscle mass, but also accepting that I will be putting on a little bit of body fat as well. But in any case, it really depends on where you start from. Um, but you do need to support your body with sufficient building blocks and the right stimulus. The second thing that we can manipulate when it comes to our metabolism is our non-exercise activity thermogenesis, as I was saying. So that can be standing, walking, taking the stairs more often, simply trying to be more active in practical ways. So uh, appreciating the house chores that you have to do from time to time like vacuum cleaning not using the elevator even though it's right there parking a little bit further away from uh, your office so that you have to take some steps whenever you're on the phone trying to walk around um, getting a standing uh, desk that's not just beneficial for posture it really does make a big difference in terms of muscular engagement throughout the entire day and even though these things seem like they're tiny people usually um, really get caught up into oh, I burned so, so many calories throughout my exercise but they neglect how much just by with day-to-day -day activities uh, they could be burning in addition so that can easily make up for another two three hundred calories per day depending on you know whether you're just sitting all day long and in addition to that uh, it just has so many positive benefits in the sense of blood of blood flow in the sense of blood pressure in the sense of just these small manipulations so helping you digest better etc i think that um in general europeans are actually probably one of the kings at um just non-exercise activity 
many, many people, you know, being very physically active in their work still or cycling to work, um, doing their groceries with their bike, etc. And um, unfortunately, I believe that many parts of the US are not quite laid out infrastructurally as well when it comes to taking um, the bicycle or walking places. Uh, hopefully that will continue to change. It's obviously quite a lot better in many cities, many of the bigger cities um, already. And yeah, even in uh, Asian or Latin American cultures and so on, people tend to be just a bit more active in their day-to-day -day life. But um, it is unfortunately something that we have to consciously fight nowadays. Otherwise, we're just going to go from bed to ch breakfast chair to car to work chair to um, you know, maybe you're training and then after that, the couch again. So sitting, 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 it's not for no reason that they say sitting is the new smoking. Um, and while we do want to aim for something like eight to 10,000 steps per day, regardless of whether you're in a weight loss phase and a muscle gaining phase, it's also not something that you need to get incredibly obsessed with. I think there is a lot of merit into tracking your steps for some time so that you know roughly what sort of routes you need to take, what where you're at in just a normal day on, and if you need to change anything. But at the same time, you shouldn't feel super tied to your step tracker and freaking out if one day you only get 7,000 steps um, or the next day you get 12,000 steps and so on. Um, it's you know it's going to balance out and in the end, it's just a rough measure. We can never know 100% for certain how many calories you're burning anyway. So that is the point to need. Um, particularly, it's important to pay attention to that when you do go into a weight loss phase because generally your body is so smart and it simply wants to adapt to the lower calorie intake by reducing your activity. And it's making you more lazy, more hesitant to just stand, to take the stairs and so on. So this is when a step counter or step tracker is actually of use so that you continue to keep the same non-exercise activity thermogenesis up. The third point that we can manipulate as touched on was the thermic effect of food. So how can we increase the calories that we are burning while our body is processing food? And the first point is to eat sufficient levels of protein. Protein is the macronutrient which is hardest to break down. Therefore, it's going to require the most amount of calories to be to be broken down, more than carbs or fats. And of course, on top of that, it's more, it's more satiating. And as I mentioned, it's helpful for your lean body mass also. Generally speaking, you're going to have a higher... A thermic effect of food from whole foods so from actually having to break down that chicken breast or that steak as opposed to just a protein shake but even a protein shake has a higher thermic effect of food than let's say a tablespoon of oil the other thing that will help increase the thermic effect of food or will make it harder uh, or is something that's hard to be broken down is foods that contain fiber. So fiber is essentially the part of carbohydrates which cannot be broken down. And um, some of it can be is soluble and some of it is insoluble, uh, but both cannot directly be broken down by the body. And because of that, like your body's still gonna try to break it down and it's gonna be a lot harder to be broken down than something without the, the fiber. So let's say white rice, a lot easier to be to be broken down than brown rice, which shouldn't, doesn't mean you should always eat brown rice, especially around your training times. We do want something that is easy to break down or easier to be absorbed anyway. <clears throat> but um, overall, we want to make sure that we're getting a sufficient amount of fiber and protein for both. It applies that more is not always better. You're just going to, going to get constipated if you overconsume fiber. And if you increase your protein way too quickly, you're going to be incredibly bloated and not digesting things well either. And if you increase protein too high, it's most likely going to come at the expense of carbs or and so on. Um, and that's not actually that great for your muscle building either. And just overall health, like carbs and fats still have a decent function. It doesn't mean that 
everybody should necessarily get to two, three, or four grams per pound of body weight. If we get about one gram of protein per pound of body weight, that is a beautiful level to be at. Fiber intake is a lot more individual and it really depends on your digestive health. People with irritable bowel syndrome or leaky gut syndrome or just generally, I mean, our our digestive tract is such a long pipe and it also it only needs to be a small um anatomical mm, kink in there which is which could potentially mean that you often get constipated so we need to be mindful of your own individual digestive capabilities but on average somewhere between 10 to 14 grams of fiber or 10 to 5 15 grams of fiber per 1000 calories consumed is a reasonable place for most people to be at so if you are a if you consume 2000 calories that would be some somewhere like 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day essentially keep playing around with that though and also distinguish between soluble and insoluble fiber because they have different functions so one of them kind of adds more bulk to your stool whereas the other makes it all a little bit more glidey <laughs> and you know um, essentially aiding on the other end so we don't want to have too little we don't want to have too much both protein and fiber should and can be increased gradually though in most cases and then lastly and that's probably the thing that people think the most of and that I have already touched on is the activity um, or exercise activity thermogenesis. So the calories we burn while training. So not necessarily just the in regards to lean body mass, but indirectly related to that. So yes, it is true. Per minute, we burn more calories with cardio, with, with hit cardio, with even with list cardio than with strength training. However, we need to, when it comes to training, we need to think long term, especially lists. So low intensity, steady state cardio, something like just jogging at a moderate pace for 40, 60 minutes or whatever, that um, is not going to contribute to muscle building. On the contrary, it might actually lead to muscle or contribute to muscle breakdown, depending on frequency and so on. And is that something that we want for muscles to be broken down? No, of course not, because as per point number one, we want to actually increase our lean body mass. Does that mean we should never do this? No, it also doesn't mean that, uh, especially in a dieting phase, it can be a good addition to your strength training. However, in order to maintain your um, lean body mass and therefore continue to increase, decrease your body fat percentage, we really want to keep this just as a tool um, that is strategically used in addition to strength training. Now, when it comes to HIT, a lot of people say, hey, I still use some weights in here. Um, that means I'm getting stronger. I also have that afterburn effect and so on yes to an extent what we need to balance out with hit is firstly it's still not going to build as much lean body mass as just strength training does full stop that is very very clear secondly it is a huge stressor on your body so it could be that it contributes to your stress levels in a way that tell your body not to let go of body fat. So if you have an excess in cortisol and that excess could also come from your training stimulus, that might lead to you not being able to drop body fat again. And there's also just a higher injury component um, than during structured strength training. So yes, while minute per minute you are technically burning more calories with uh, cardio than with strength training in the long term you can teach your body to burn more at rest much better with strength training than with either of those forms again it doesn't mean you should never do them it just means um, strategically implement them if you have a well-designed hit workout once twice or whatever a week at the end of your strength training you know for most people that should be fine 
If you are someone who is completely burned out from your day-to-day activities, you're overdoing everything already anyway, and you try to do hit every single day, probably very counterproductive, to be honest. I personally come from a CrossFit background as, a background, as most of you know. I used to do a lot of CrossFit. I loved CrossFit. I still think it's a great sport. I do not think it is the best thing for body composition for most people. Uh, I also don't think it's best for health for most people. And therefore, I'm very cautious with prescriptions when it comes to high-intensity um, interval training And I personally have suffered from injuries from it as well. Um, But there are certainly a lot, a lot of positive things that have come out of this sport, um, even when it's just about um, encouraging more women to do strength training and encouraging encouraging more people in general to use a barbell and uh, dumbbells and kettlebells and free weights and functional training in in general. So just the emphasis has changed since things like CrossFit in the sense of functionality and not just being focused on machines and so on. So last point when it comes to um, training here is my recommendation not even to track calories burned during a workout because it's really not indicative of your of anything really a your calorie tracker most likely doesn't know your dieting history it doesn't know how many times you have run this 10k before because the first time you run a 10k you're going to be burning way more calories doing that than the 10th time your body is so smart and adapts to it so well so whenever you feel like you're getting better at something that actually means you are burning less calories added most of the time so my recommendation would be not to track calories burnt simply including a general um, aim of exercise into your calorie prescription so you know you when you when you calculate your maintenance calories or even calorie deficit or surplus calories calories and you type into your calorie calculator or your own formula your activity just think about okay how many times a week am i training is it three times a week is it four to six times per week and use that as opposed to being too fixated on how much you burned um yeah so that is basically the four things we can manipulate the manipulate the best firstly our body fat percentage so increasing lean body mass through strength training and through eating the right amount and right kind of food secondly making sure that we keep our non-exercise activity thermogenesis up. So even in a calorie deficit, making sure we're getting enough steps, but not obsessing about it. Thirdly, consuming enough protein and fiber so that our body burns more calories by breaking down food. And fourthly, not getting too fixated on the calories we burn through exercise because that is a small percentage anyway but even with the exercise aiming everything or as much as we can and want to towards increasing lean body mass of course if you are a performance athlete and you're not actually too worried about body fat percentage and you well you're probably not listening to this in that case potentially but um, in that case you know focus on what benefits your sport the most if you're a runner this is completely irrelevant but these recommendations are for someone who simply wants to increase their calorie output at rest in order to have a higher metabolic rate and be able to eat more calories while doing nothing (laughs) and to sum it up really just an encouragement to accept what you can change so once again if you're a shorty if you're a woman if you have done um dieting phase after dieting phase in the past it is what it is now you can only look ahead and act on what you are given so focusing on a consistent protein intake good progressive overload in your strength training and um, giving your body what it needs in certain times of stress or in certain times throughout our life Focus on the body fat percentage as opposed to your the, the scale weight as that is much more indicative anyway of your calorie output and don't get too carried away with in-body scans, etc. either because oftentimes they are not accurate. Um, and so, you know, how you feel, how you look and measurements that you take, they are going to be another metric to focus on in addition to things like that. 
I hope you found this helpful. And if you liked this episode, as I said, please give me a rating or review. Please subscribe to our podcast. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, or share the episode on social. Very much appreciated. You can also follow us on Instagram at Nutrition Coaching and Life or head to our website, www.nutritioncoachingandlife.com, where we provide more valuable content. Have a wonderful day. Now go out and work on your best self.